Few groups have been as constantly innovative and exciting as Sparks. Formed in Los Angeles in the late 60s, they burst into our teenage UK consciousness with a performance on top of the pops of their single, This Town, that visually and musically was a talk of the playgrounds of the UK for the next few weeks. The song itself was a bizarre, climactic slice of music hall gone glam rock crazy. Sound like nothing I've heard before and nothing I've heard since. The brothers themselves were something else. Ron was playing the keyboards, staring at the camera with that weird, captivating, hypnotic eyeball contact. His brother Russ was a pop star consummate, a skinny Jim Morrison with a high voluting, high octane, high decibel voice. Sounded amazing. In the years that followed, they went through several styles, always inventive. Their new album, A Steady Drip, 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 is arguably and classically the best one they've released yet. I caught up with the two brothers in Los Angeles to talk about the virus, lockdown, and especially the new album and the dynamic that works between them. And every single one sounds like a single. Or was that the intention when you're writing the album in the first place? Or is it just the songs, they just come and there's no... You don't really understand what the, what the whole collection is going to be till you get to the end of it. I mean, it's pretty much the latter because, you know, whenever we've ever come up with something that's been commercial in other people's terms, it's always been by accident. And so, you know, we kind of don't gear things that way. I mean, even if we even if we could, we 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 don't because we know that that those moments are just they're just things that just happen along along the way but uh you know we we kind of approached this album there wasn't an overall kind of concept to it in a musical sense i mean we just went at it went at it as discrete songs and then in the end it kind of for some reason it has like a cohesiveness to it that uh just you know not not so much of a thematic you know a a, a thematic uh, cohesiveness, but just a, a musical cohesiveness that, that everything seems to balance everything else. And, you know, that's always the tricky thing about in the end when you're making up the song order, because so much is determined by how songs sit with other other songs. And, you know, and in particular, the first song, you're, you're always debating how do you want to uh, convey what the album is about? Is that song really what you want to present in case somebody has a short attention span and only listens to the one song. I mean, how, how do you manage to remain so fresh sounding? Because it just occurred to me the other day that, that your Sparks actually is a band from the 1960s. You know, if he's starting all the way back from Half Nelson, I know you were young at the time. Well, all, most of the groups in the 1960s get the old flash of inspiration. That new Dylan single was quite amazing. But somehow Sparks, always every album, it's like an adventure, and it's always sounded fresh, and it's always sounding new. And after all this time, how did you manage to do that? Well, I, you know, we just uh, spend a lot of time working at it. Um, that we, you know, we we're not lazy, and we have we kind of have a a passion for doing what we do, and so we, um, you know, and and people that our Sparks fans expect us to be doing uh, kind of forward thinking and, you know, um, continue with the, you know, with the same kind of musical, uh, you know, perspective that we had right from the beginning. And we don't want to let people down ever by, you know, getting lazy with what we do. And so it's kind of just a real mission for, for doing what we're, we're doing to um, not be, kind of phoning it in, which, you know, you, you kind of get the sense that um, it's, it, what's, it's a really easy thing to do, especially for a band with 24 albums to kind of just be cranking it out and not giving um, much, you know, real thought to what you're doing. But we, we take a long time. The album took about a year to record. And I think that's, um, you know, it, it's, it's a long time for, for an album, but um, we think, you know, we're, it, it takes that long for us to do something that we think is really solid. We do have to throw a lot of stuff away to get to that point. I mean, are we just seeing the tip of the iceberg here? 
Yeah, all, always actually, because uh, you know people don't have to know about uh, what you don't want them to know about, and so <laughs> so it's really. Imp- I mean, the one thing that we really, you know, we have worked with some really incredible producers in the past, and one thing we've learned is to be really merciless is kind of as far as not clinging on to something just because you think well i wrote it it's got to be you know amazing uh that you really have to be kind of a little bit dispassionate about it and and see the song almost as if somebody else had come up with it and then and then decide so you know we're we're pretty hard on ourselves as far as throwing away things uh and you know in it, with the hope that that in the end what what's there maybe it appears like it was predestined to always be those songs but it, it definitely wasn't that way at all I mean, how does the filtering process work i, I know that generally uh, you ron you 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 write the songs generally not specifically uh, and russ comes in and does the vocals and it's an incredible piece of magic to put in there and it's that's a very co-creator process but is it between you the decisions on what goes on the record is it a very equal you know that the final cut yeah i mean it, it usually were i mean there's there's consensus as to which songs are the ones that that make the grade and you know we at a certain point we we don't finish up ones that we think are are kind of maybe not up to uh, the same standard and and so i mean it it kind of is just a a process that we have and you know at a certain point you kind of we're both pretty much in sync about which things we think are are making the grade and so uh yeah so it, it's it's not that that part of it's not that that hard things just become really evident as to what what you really uh think are sounding really great and which ones are you know you kind of go oh, i'm not so sure i know your brothers and there's always a uh... I mean, some brothers don't get on, but there's always a, a very symbiotic thing with brothers. And those decisions, you, almost like twins in a way, do you, you kind of feel the same things? Or or does it get very tense sometimes uh, around uh, whoever's house you're writing the, uh, the music? Well, in general, just because we have uh, a similar sensibility about, you know, music in general, that that we're in agreement on almost everything. But there, there are there are songs along the way that sometimes one of us feels a lot more passionately about, and then it, you know, it becomes a courtroom drama. You know? <laughs> I mean, I was just, uh, I was just saying then, uh, Ron, that a lot of songs are very dense lyrically. And I have I've often, and a lot of people I know who love sparks, I've often marveled the way Russ can actually manage to cram all those words in and make them sound like they're all meant to be there and fit. You know, is it, I mean, do you sometimes do that almost on purpose to make it difficult to sing? Well, it, it isn't necessarily on purpose, but I kind of don't take into consideration <laughs> the difficulties of 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 the lyric of the lyrics being being sung. I kind of kind of see it just as the song and just the technical issues with actually somebody both hitting those notes and and singing those lyrics. Are are something that I don't really take in, into con, in, into consideration. I mean, it's I think now that that Russell has sung this, you know, those songs for for so long that that I just kind of assume that anything goes as far as uh, you know where the notes go, what the words are, or or the gaps between between the notes. So so uh, you know, once it leaves my hands. It's not my problem. <laughs> I mean, do you do you hear his voice in your head when you're writing the song? Well, it's a that's a difficult question to answer. I I I mean, I I think in a maybe in a general sense that that um, that I know what the capabilities that a, that a melody with a certain thing will work with Russell's voice, but I, I'm not. I'm not certain if I necessarily am thinking specifically of, of his voice or or not. It's a, it's a, that's a it's a difficult thing because when you're when I'm writing the first sorry about the uh, siren but uh, build, building is on fire so I'll make this quick. <laughs> uh, 
No, I just play on. <laughs> yeah. Um, when when I'm writing, I'm kind of so uh, focused on what I'm doing uh, that I'm kind of not really even thinking about uh, the recording process so so much. It's only just focusing on the song. So I'm not I'm not really you know concentrating that much on Russell's voice, other than just in the back of my mind knowing that he's capable of you know singing in so many different ways and that that the song will work when when he does sing and then and then it'll also will will sound will sound much much better than 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 what what i'm demoing it as so russell how, how do you maintain your voice i mean singing that that intensity and that kind of pitch uh in this time of life it's, that takes quite something. Most people's voices are, are, are dropping a few octaves by now, aren't they? Yeah. No, I, I mean, it, I don't know. It's just, um, there's the boring answer, just, you know, trying to take care of my, trying to take care of my voice and being uh, physically active, as you've seen in my special <laughs> series of videos showing how you too can be a, <clears throat> a singer, uh, what's, what's involved uh, physically to do that. So, um, you know, just trying to take, you know, you just try to take care of yourself and just, I don't know, having a pride in wanting to retain the, the same key of the songs as they were originally done as well. Cause you know, it, it really changes the way a song sounds. If you, um, transpose it down to a key, that's more, uh, that's, that's easier to sing in. And so we, you know, try to kind of, push it with the new songs to keep them, you know, the way that they sound the best. And also with, you know, doing, you know, live concerts to, to keep them the original keys, which, um, you know, isn't always the case with some, some acts. Um, so, but it's, uh, yeah. So we, you know, there's just a, a pride factor. It'd be, it'd be fair to say Sparks have had one of the strangest careers in, in pop music. I mean, you were huge in Britain in 1974, then you're big in France and you're big in Germany. Then America finally gets its head around you for a brief period of time. I mean, it's, I, I can never work out if, if you're like a very big underground band or, or a sort of smaller pop band. I mean, what, do, do you think the terms of being a pop band or, or an art band, or, or do these things not even matter at all? Well, I don't, I mean, we don't really see those distinctions i don't think at, at all i mean we just do what we do and then we hear from other people what it is that we that we are you know and so i mean the only you know the only focus we have is and and the only thing we can control is just doing music that we think is really good and being really creative and art you know having an artistic bent to what we're doing and and everything else surrounding it is out of our control you know and you hope that everybody um that's working with you uh is as uh thorough in how they uh they work as how how we are and that that's the only thing you know we can hope for and that's the only thing you know the only thing we can do is just do uh the music side of it and and then it's out of our hands so uh, i think that oh yeah. Look at it, yeah, once it, yeah, yeah. I was just, I was just going to say, I think we're, you know, anybody would want to be as popular as they can be, but I think, you know, looking at it realistically, we're, we're kind of at the right level of, of, of acceptance by a mass audience, where, where we have enough backing and enough people that are supporting us to always be able to continue doing what we're doing, but then not enough where where we lose our motivation to kind of always be proving ourselves so it it's i think we're in kind of the exact right position even though you know any anybody want would want to be massively popular <laughs> that makes life easier <laughs> well not always so but, um, maybe but maybe too easy you know yeah people get lazy yeah so so, so ron when melodically you, you write in a style that's it's not like anybody else at all. I mean, I can hear, you can hear uh, old, so old European music in there. You can hear really weird chord progression, strange melodies that somehow you make sense of in a pop kind of way. And this is partly for Russell as well, because the way you sing, 
in a very operatic style, completely makes Sparks utterly unique. So, first you Ron, is that is that something? Is, is, is that something that you've always been very aware of, or is, is it just when you sit there at the piano? And you always I mean, you play piano to write the songs. Is, is that is that because you play piano those songs turn out like that? That kind of logically. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of it is that. I mean, I do write some songs on on guitar. I mean, I'm not. I don't play guitar well, but well enough just to write songs. And then sometimes when I'm lucky, stuff just comes in the, into my head. But nowadays, I kind of have to force it with the with the keyboard and and things turn out a certain way when when you're uh when you're doing it on a keyboard as opposed to i don't know more natural uh vocal uh movements that you might do when you're when you're playing with the with, and singing along with a with a guitar i mean you know it's it's odd that things uh kind of developed the way they did because our our tastes when we first started off were were only like only pop music and not you know rock things like like the early Who and Kinks. It wasn't that we had this broad view of uh, Western musical culture or any you know you know or any anything like that. And it just that things kind of seeped out and and you know people would say oh that you know what you're doing it sounds like you know Gilbert and Sullivan or it sounds like you know Stravinsky or you know something, and so we <clears throat> we we then would kind of check up on these people and find out what it was. Yeah. But 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 our origin, our, the way that we started was was not a broad musical vision. I mean, our our passion always was was just was rock music, and 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 we kind of didn't really have an interest at, at the beginning, at least uh, in other kinds of music. Although the Kinks is an interesting one to mention because they're writing, yes, it was sort of rock and roll, but very musical as well. So there's already the doors opening to other ways of making music. Um, yes, yes. that's the, the Kinks, you said, is that what you yeah, said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. because Ray Davis was yeah, yeah. more like English musical than, a, yeah. than yeah. Elvis. Yeah. And, and the thing with, with the early Who where they were writing – a lot of times about these very particular vignettes about situations where it wasn't kind of a broad statement. It was a really specific use of, of, of language to, to describe a very kind of narrow situation, but that kind of uh, seemed really personal. And I, I think that, that, that sort of writing really, really did influence me like things like, like tattoo and pictures of Lily and those kind of songs where, where it isn't some broad statement, you know, about mankind or about, or about feelings or anything. It's a, it's like a very narrow kind of mm. uh, vignette, but, it, but it isn't really closed off. I mean, it's something that kind of has a, a bigger scope to it if you kind of see it in a different way. And so, so I always like language that's, that's really, um, if I if I can, being really specific about things, not not uh, writing so much in a in a general kind of way, and also maybe not writing from an something influencing me to write specifically about that event. I mean, I can't really think of any songs that we've ever done where there was an event or a, or a or a personal situation that 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 kind of led to the song other than just in a general way you know you you're you're always kind of bombarded by by things coming at you so it influences how you're writing but but nothing specific but with also uh with a very surreal sense of humor mixed into it as well well i always i always thought you i think just part of our that my love originally for those kinds of bands was that there was humor within the songs and i kind of i tried to kind of have some of that within what what we were doing because so much of what los angeles music was uh was about at, at the time when we were starting was very uh just very serious i mean it was heartfelt for sure but 
but it was very serious and kind of, and any kind of humor in songs is often seen as something negative where where you know it's a a comedy act and if you you know if there is any humor in a song you can't you can't possibly have depth to it mm -hmm. but uh, you know i kind of never i never ag agreed with that and i think that what we have attempted in in quite a few of our songs is to have things working on two levels where it can have humor but then also there's another mm. side to it that's has you know more pathos or 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 sincerity or you know something something underneath that so the, the song works both ways it isn't just a comedy song yeah, I mean, there's some really serious songs like Mother Nature is a very serious song and also very apt <laughs> for, the, for the times we're in. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, Russell, so the, the vocals, um, I mean, amazing, the amazing vocals, very operatic sounding. Um, and is, is, is that something that's important uh, to bring to the songs for you? Or is it just, it's just the only way you can sing? <laughs> well, it's, it seems like the way the songs are written kind of dictates the way the singing is. So um, now it's really hard to separate the two, you know, what, what, uh, which is leading the, uh, the, the, the way. And so, um, yeah, I think it's, it's more a case of just those song Ron writes those songs and I kind of sing them that way. You know, if I, and that's the way my voice is, if I could sing the songs like little Richard or something, I would, uh, <laughs> you know, I would try to give that a, a, a spin, but, um, but I, my voice, unfortunately, isn't little Richard esque enough to, to do that. So it, it's being done, you know, kind of naturally for the way I sing, but then the, that also being dictated by the way the songs are, are written too. So it's, yeah, that's more the case. What's interesting is that, um, the, the surreal humor, which is fantastic in the songs, well, the vocals give it uh, this epic melodrama. And is that a deliberate thing as well, you know, that contrast? Or is that, again, is that just the way, it's just the only way it can be done? Well, I, I mean, I think one of the things is I just really like the recording process and that, you know, um, stacking up vocals to make them, you know, sometimes when it when it's justified within the, the specific song, um, you know, to really make use of of the recordings to to take my voice and then do, you know, 30 of my voice um, either singing with me or behind me or whatever to make it something really aggressive. Cause uh, I'm not, I'm not playing an instrument, but that's one way that I can kind of uh, mm -hmm. impose some sort of, um, I don't know, aggression sometimes into the, the way the vocals are delivered and to have them kind of hyper, uh, hyper, uh, you know, um, you know, the, the intensity of them being kind of, uh, you know, uh, oversized is, is something that's kind of appealing. And, and so I think that's one, one of the fun things just about being able to have a studio on your own and to take as much time as you want to record as you can experiment and do all sorts of things, you know, and, and try things with all kinds of, um, stacking of vocals and, and, uh, you know, making the voice become a, an instrument of some of sorts in, in some uh, instances. I mean, do you get right inside the words? Does it matter to you what Ron's trying to say, or does it not matter at all? It's just the sound and the shape of the words and the melody. Yeah. No, it, it matters. It, it it matters a lot. Yeah, the the lyrics are really. I think the lyrics are really strong, and so you know, you, I don't want to. Um, bring bring the song down <laughs> by the by a poor rendition of what he was trying to say so uh no the the lyrics are really they're really important and so uh you know there's there's ways cuz you know you record stuff and 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 it's really interesting how just a, on a different take it can it can give a different tone to the song uh depending on how you performed it and the the intonation and just uh, how you delivered a specific line. So it, it gets, that stuff gets really uh, start really getting really specific and honing in on, on one word even that, that may have been done, uh, you know, not the, the best way it could have been. And so you go, but yeah, but 
everything surrounding it was good. So sometimes even, you know, you'll even punch in on the recording on one word just to, to um, spruce it up a bit, you know, um, and make sometimes it. Sometimes it, it works in a different way where, where uh, we have a song and, and the lyrics aren't quite there. There might be just the title phrase or not even that, but we kind of want to see what it sounds like with the singing. So there, there are kind of dummy lyrics written for the song and then and then when the when the real lyrics come in the song isn't as good as it was uh, when when the dummy ly- lyrics were being sung just because when it when it then becomes time for them to be specific and and actually heard all of a sudden the magic of the demo uh is <laughs> gone i mean fortunately that doesn't happen all that often but it it does happen where it's really disappointing where or words that are just kind of gibberish actually sound much better than the words. You have to go back to those words then. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Do you have a discussion about the lyrics? You know, like you're saying what, what the song's meant to be trying to say, or, or again, because your brothers are on your close, it's just an understanding. You just know. So, so I guess this one's for you or so. But you just have an understanding of what the song is when it's presented. Yeah, I think that's more the case that it, it, we don't, I don't know, we don't kind of uh, analyze the words after, you know, after the fact, because uh, they, you know, they come usually pretty fully formed. And um, yeah, and I, I get, I get them. <laughs> Most of the time, I understand what I'm singing. <laughs> <laughs> well, some, some, not, not I fake it. I don't understand what I'm writing sometimes. So, yeah. <laughs> and all, the other thing is, I mean, there are last minute changes that happen where, where you know, when, when the lyrics are being written and you think something is, is a good rhyme and then you realize that it's not a rhyme at all. And so, so there are last minute changes to songs where, it, you know, when, when you actually hear it sung, uh, it, it, something is there that you didn't, you didn't uh, expect. And so you just were always open to those last minute, last minute changes. I mean, with, with the songs and with the music, it's, there's a very filmic quality about it. And somehow even in a three minute song, you manage to almost compress the whole film into it. They're very visual, you know, you're, you're, not just lyrically, but musically as well. And is, is that intentional? I know you're both big film fans. And is that a key influence in the songwriting? Yeah, well, I think I think that for us, uh, I mean, I don't know how much of it is related to an interest in films, but we tend to see songs in a cinematic way, like large, large scale and and technicolor and and kind of over sometimes over uh, hyped emotions and and uh, because you know we 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 in general don't like kind of tamed down things and. And kind of that that larger than life quality that's a part of film so much of the time is something that that we enjoy injecting into into songs and and the whole thing of of having within a three or four minute song uh, something that's so so large and goes through so many stages you know it, it it's kind of miraculous. Uh, where you know you you can do things that you could never do in a film where where so much can happen where it can just start off huge and and so you know we we are film fans but i think that that the influence of the film it isn't it isn't that you know we're we're writing songs about humphrey bogart or anything but it's it's more just the the idea of something really large and colorful and and with a lot you know a lot of emotion sometimes those things are are things that that kind of are a part of the songs i mean it just it's just i'm not sure how much that was influenced by films and how much that's just a part of what we like in songs but in either case uh you know that that is something that's there. do you i mean with sparks uh like i said in the beginning of the interview you you always manage to sound really contemporary are you very much aware of what goes on in contemporary music or do you just exist in your own sort of strange world? 
No, we're we're um, we pay attention to to what's happening because you want to you know you we you want to see especially when you're you know when we're mixing an album even um, you know sonically to hear what's going on and you don't want to kind of you know do something you, you want to be uh, at least have the knowledge of what's going on and you can ignore what's going on but you should be aware you know of what's going on and so yeah we're we're uh, you know, we, we pay attention. I mean, we get less uh, inspired, I think, by, by a lot of what we hear. We want to be inspired. I mean, that's the whole thing is you kind of, you, you want to hear something that just really um, knocks you out and, uh, um, you know, mm-hmm. that, that you can go, wow, we better uh, take it up a notch to compete with the, with the Joneses. Um, but, uh, but, it, but in any case, yeah, just we we are, you know, we we listen to listen to we listen to stuff. Yeah. yeah. You just got a me- a me- did you get a message going up saying this meeting has been upgraded by the host and Yeah, I just saw that. Oh, I just click it on. Right. We've been you mind if, you mind if I Woo! click okay? Uh, just, yeah. Excuse me. There, okay. Yeah, all nice and tidy now. Yeah. Re so upgrade. Well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're upgraded. Now. <laughs> Who do you got to know at Zoom, man, to get a free <laughs> upgrade? Mr. Zoom himself. Yeah. So yeah, we, we're, we, got, we got friends in, in, high, in high places. <laughs> so in, in the UK, for many people my age, um, the classic Top of the Pops appearance for this town is pretty mind-blowing. I mean, I remember the next day at school, people just couldn't stop talking about it. So, so the, it was not just the song, but the whole performance and what Ron looked like, what you looked like as well, Russell. The whole thing, huge impact. I mean, was were you were you aware of of that that, that moment? You know that how much impact that was going to have. Well, we were aware of it after the fact. We, you know, <laughs> we we went on uh, first time on top of the pops. Uh, saying this is pretty amazing and and just and fun and um then we didn't realize i think the impact that our performance had or was going to have um there was no way we could have imagined that and then then we start you know you start getting feedback of and people start um following the band and listening to the band and then all of a sudden the band's getting popular and so then you're realizing that you know that those shows that top of the pops was having a huge impact and uh, no, it was, it was pretty amazing, but we weren't, we had no clue as to um, what <laughs> the impact would be of those, those shows. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing too, that there's no real equivalent to that anymore. Unfortunately that where it's a show, especially at that time, there were only, I think there were four TV stations in Britain at the time, I think, so yeah. odd three maybe three yeah, probably yeah. yeah and then the fourth one came a bit later but um so odds are you have a one in three chance that everybody watching television is going to be watching <laughs> watching you and then it's and then that that show top of the pops was just popular in general so the odds are even higher than one in three so if you take that by all the people living in in britain um that's a lot of people watching the show so there's you know, there's no impact and it's, and it's national. There's no thing, no equivalent to that. There's, you know, now there's, you know, there's Saturday night live in the States, but it's once a week and it's one act and, you know, top of the pops had it, it had a different sort of impact where it was completely obviously focused on, on music. So, uh, you know, it was, it was amazing, uh, phenomena and, uh, and it was, you know, it was just a really great, uh, you know, exciting period. And to see also the, contemporaries that were also on the show too because she kind of felt there was a like a uh, healthy competition you know who you know who's gonna upstage the other band this this week and all and it was all it was all really uh you know it's ex- really exciting did you feel like you had any contemporaries was would you feel like bowie was a contemporary because that that, that year 74 was the peak of glam rock and you kind of you sort of fitted in there, but of course, being sparked, you kind of didn't really fit in there either. I think more, I mean, more the band that we felt more as a contemporary were, were Roxy Music. I mean, we didn't, we didn't really hang out with them or anything, but 
but uh, they were on the same label, Island Records, as we were. And, and you know, there, there was a visual element to what they, they were doing and, and a real stylized approach and really stylized singing. So even though, so we, we kind of felt, you know, a certain kind of competition, you know, to try to do, do things that were, would kind of at least, uh, bump past them a little, a little bit from, from time, from time to time. So I think more, more Roxy music than, than Bowie. I mean, we, you know, we, we had, obviously we admired Bowie, but we kind of didn't, it, it, felt like a different kind of relationship with with him than when then than a band that seemed like they were kind of running on on parallel tracks to us at the time did you uh did you have any idea of how terrifying people found your performance wrong <laughs> well st- i i, <laughs> I learned i learned pretty quickly i mean i i it it you know it, it was all bizarre because uh we it was just the power of close-ups and all you know we 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 had never really done very much television and so so when cameras were close up the subtlest kind of uh look could have a, a tremendous impact and and you know i when we were first starting off i always was trying to figure out how a keyboard player fits into a band that's trying to be uh kind of semi English in their approach to being flashy on stage. And, you know, I could never really come up with uh, a solution. So I just kind of, kind of went, went stoic, which is more my nature anyway. And so that, you know, that could be seen as, as, is boring, but as, as it turned out, when there's a, a close up camera on you, uh, that does have a certain, power to it so i i learned pretty pretty quickly what the effect was but it you know it it, it surprised me as you know just that that was what what it turned out to be so were you a, were you a psychotic charlie chapman or or you were a, a comedic adolf hitler no one could ever work it out or was it just ron with it with a pen with a toothbrush mustache well i mean i mean i always like i always like silent comedians i mean more more Buster Keaton actually than Charlie mm-hmm. Chaplin, who you know had the similar mustache. But so it, it was kind of even even the way I looked. It was when we first went to move to Britain. Both of us had kind of longer hair, and uh, and I I went to a just some salon and just got it hacked off. And uh, our manager told us that this was a huge mistake that. <laughs> the thing with two brothers who kind of looked a little similar, that was such a good concept and that I kind of ruined that concept. So, you know, you, you kind of do things and then you don't know if it's the right thing. And then it turns out that it, in the end, it seems sort of predestined. Mm-hmm. I mean, no, nobody thought you were brothers for years. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So, so Russell, um, Obviously, you lived in LA, you've been back in America a long time now and been living in LA. But is, is there much things you miss about living in England? Much that we miss about the yeah, you know, yeah, the weather, tea. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I mean, we we spend so much time there anyway in in Britain that I think we we kind of have the uh, the the benefits of both you know both places. We we're fortunate that um, I mean we live in LA, but we spend a lot of time there. So it's kind of like so familiar to us. And I mean, I think as far as just living, we're, you know, we're born, we're born in Los Angeles. So, um, you know, we, it's, it's our home in that sort of way. But I think if, you know, if it weren't the case where we're, we have one foot in, in the UK practically all the time, I mean, I think we would, we would miss that. But as far as living day to day, I mean, we have our own studio here. So I, we can work and that's a huge factor. And then, and we do like the blue sunshine too. So that's um, something, uh, another on the plus side, blue sunshine, uh, but you have better tea on the (laughs) negative side. So um, yeah, there's, there's, uh, 
pros and cons to each, but, you know, we're, but we, we don't even have to make a choice because we we're in both places often. So. I mean, now you lived in America a long time. Do you actually, I'm not, and obviously you are American, but musically, you still don't sound American. Do you feel any closer to American musical culture after all this time? I mean, not, not really because, uh, you know, we, we moved to Britain in the seventies just to kind of, uh, go somewhere where what we were doing would be accepted and, and knowing that we really didn't fit in with the general American musical culture. I mean, things have really changed now because just with, with the internet, it, almost like the na- your national origin, it doesn't, it doesn't even matter. Everything is just one, one thing now, but you know, we, we kind of, uh, we don't really have an, I, we don't identify at, as like as an American band and kind of don't feel any more natural here now than we than in in the musical sense than than we ever did. Mm, you still feel like to me like a, a very British band. Well, I, I think that that really is our our basic sensibility. I mean, it's what it's what you know, even if we're from here, but our our kind of uh, our whole way of thinking and what really excites us about pop music are, are what the, the British bands brought to it. And even, even to this day, the one, you know, in general, I mean, it's hard to generalize about things, but, but, you know, the British music scene even now is more in a general sense, more exciting to us than, than the scene here. It hasn't, it hasn't kind of, homogenized worldwide to the extent where where things have become uh as uh colorful and interesting to us musically here as as they are in britain so i mean that's that is one thing that we when we go to 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 britain that you know just to to see that that music is somehow even though it everything is fairly universal now that there is a, a real sharpness a lot of the times to, to British music. I know and we yeah. try to identify with that too. In a sense, it's another generalisation, but I mean, American music's always been very good at being extrovert and wonderful at it. And English music's another generalisation, be more introverted. And do you feel like you fit into that kind of thing, that introverted artfulness that, um, I mean, you say the songs, they, they haven't, they have an emotional uh, clout, of course they do, you can feel it, but everything's disguised in very clever words, you know, and s- so you never say quite directly, well, often you don't say quite directly what, what you're thinking, which is brilliant, and that's what we love in England, you know, the layer and layer and layer, and it's somewhere underneath, and is that something you're aware of? Well, I think they're in, it's introverted maybe in, in the sense of uh, the writing of the songs, but then... The the strange thing is that that for us a lot of American bands are a little too introverted on stage. So there's so it seems like a lot of British music, while it might be introverted as far as the sensibility of the writing and and the attitude lyrically, that when it comes to the presentation they're more extroverted. And that that's something that that appeals to us that that you know, that kind of uh, way of being introverted and that kind of way of being extroverted, uh, it, the, it kind of fits in more with, with our thinking uh, the, way, the way it is in Britain. The theatricality. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if, that, if theatricality is kind of being extroverted, then yeah, maybe in that sense. I mean, we, I, I, I know what you're saying about, you know, just the... In, introvert in, being introverted in, in the other way but uh when it comes to presentation it just seems like that things can be just as musically valid and and be flashy at the same at the same time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. is that true for you as well uh, russell yeah yeah i mean it's um it's just um 
you know, that, that, I mean, it's always been that way from the very beginning where we, you know, just gravitated to British bands that were coming to America and, and just the, the whole, you know, side of it being kind of, at least to our minds at the time that they were aware of the whole, the whole presentation was important. The image was important. The, the, the music was important and, um, you know, album covers were important. So every, you know, all of that was just the sensibility seemed more in, uh, akin to our, our sensibility. And so, I mean, then that holds true now, I think where, um, you know, and it's kind of opposed to, you know, more that there's, you know, the back then the whole Laurel Canyon singer songwriter thing, even though that, you know, the people were really good at their craft and all of that, but it just, that whole thing of being sincere and in that sort of way, that kind of sincerity, we, all the British bands we, we liked at the time were to us were equally sincere, but just showing that in a different kind of way than, than what was going on here. So, we, so that whole, the whole sensibility kind of um, still is more aligned to, to our way of uh, our preference as well. And another fascination is the, the roles that you play in Sparks. So uh, for us in England, I mean, we got there late 74. We didn't even realize that you'd been around five, six years at that point. I thought this is a brand new band that appeared for the day before. And um, that time you, you were playing a great role as the teeny bop pop star and looked fantastic at it. And Ron had that fantastically bizarre image. But over the years, those roles have kind of changed. And is it, do you deliberately play with those roles and mess about with them? Because last time I saw you play the Ritz in Manchester, with just the two of you playing, it was a wonderful gig, absolutely fantastic. And, um, and, and Ron was playing the piano for about an hour and suddenly got up and stage dived into the crowd, which everyone just couldn't believe and everyone was just laughing. It was so funny. And is it, is it like a deliberate deconstruction of your image that goes on sometimes you swap roles and mess them around well i suppose i mean i i uh it's easier for me to kind of move out i've you know russell's pretty con- consistent but uh every once in a while i i get a little antsy and so i uh, have to show my 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 extroverted side tap dancing and your stage yeah. <laughs> and i you know i i kind of don't you know that that was another case right i never thought that that would have any kind of uh reaction it was just kind of done one time on the spur of the moment and and it's really bizarre because we've played some really large festivals in mexico city and tokyo and kind of that that one moment it kind of has a it kind of has a universal appeal i don't mean to be tooting my own horn but but uh (laughs) it it's like it's so strange just thinking you know just kind of analyzing it where where something that you think is kind of uh maybe silly in a certain way that that and where people have seen so much from so many different bands that that would have any kind of impression so uh yeah night after night ron's dance is uh is received by sparks aficionados and by newcomers alike and it's always astounding yeah like we we mentioned in you know mexico city playing for the first time and you know a lot of new new fans that you know we we uh we managed to uh to to get when we played there in this this big festival and then you know we did he did his dance for the first time and uh brought down the entire uh festival when he did it so it was pretty amazing yeah I mean, when you play now, I mean, that gig in Manchester, I've never, I've, I've been to a lot of gigs in my life and I very rarely felt that much emotion in a room, uh, love for a band. I remember you went off for the encore and people just wouldn't let you go. I and mean, normally people do the encore thing for about a minute and go home. <laughs> but people just going, no, this is genuine. <laughs> you look quite taken aback when you came back on stage. Yeah, well, it, no, it's, you know, it's amazing. And I mean, it's, it's really a, a special thing, you know, the, the live performances and especially in Britain, because, you know, there's always been that bond from the very beginning. And so it's just, for us, it's just uh, amazing and really heartwarming that, that it gets that kind of reaction and so, so genuine. And um, so we, uh, 
we always relish the times of playing, you know, playing in the UK because they're, uh, they are really special and, and they are, you know, they are really emotional. It's really, uh, you really sense that there's a, a community and a, a kind of a, a sparks club with everybody mm-hmm. that comes to the shows and they all have the, you know, the, the secret password that they know <laughs> to get into the sparks club. And, uh, you really, you know, we really sense that, you know, when we're performing, even you kind of really feel, uh, that something special is going on. So we, uh, you know, we really appreciate those, those times and really love it. Over all the albums, I mean, is it 26 now? I just can't remember. Or is it 24? 24. 24. 24 albums. Um, apart from the time you had to go and do them all again. <laughs> and nobody, nobody could possibly understand how you can remember all the lyrics. That's insane. Um, but do you, do you sense there's any kind of journey going on there? Or is it, you know, like some bands have a curve, you know, like the Beatles, it starts off being beat, psychedelic, back to the roots, split up or whatever. Is, is, it, is it a journey with Sparks or is each one just completely gone off its own tangent? Well, I, I don't know. I just think the whole thing is uh, the whole thing is a journey and that we don't have a plan at all of what we're doing next. And I think that's what keeps the whole thing fresh. And so I think the there's a there is a journey, but. Uh, specifically what that journey is going to next entail we you know we don't we don't have a plan and so it's just to you know keep doing uh, doing something that's um exciting for us so yeah i mean we've gone through different areas like with the electronic thing working with giorgio moroder and then and then on on little beethoven where we kind of were trying to kind of reinvent how we were even coming up with songs to not have a traditional format somehow. So th- those things kind of, you know, come in and out, but, uh, but it, it's, it, there isn't like some, you know, plan like now we're going to do such and such an album. It usually just kind of e- evolves from, from what, what the songs are or, or, you know, where, where you, if you're just kind of bored with the way you're, working at a certain time you know what what can you do to 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 change that because, i mean that's the most important i mean i was just gonna say that's the most important thing is just that, yeah, yeah. that you can't kind of fake fake your enthusiasm for what you're doing so so you have to be like really passionate about each thing and and also just you know you don't want to waste a year on something that you're lukewarm about so so it really is important that that in that way, that the direction of what you're doing is something that you feel really excited about. Finally, if we ever get out of this virus situation and you do manage to get over here and tour, um, what, is it, what, what are you planning for the tour? Is it just going to be, is there such a thing as a straight sparks performance or are you going to do something different? You're going to play with it or maybe you just don't even know yet. Well, I think that, you know, now we've, we've, done all sorts of uh presentations live we've done ones where we've used you know we've been a more traditional band we've done ones where we've used projections so it has some kind of um punctuation visually to what we're doing or or to what the lyrics of a particular song might be and then we've done you know one presentation where it's just been the two of us on the two hands one mouth um phase but but you know i think you know, the last couple of tours have been just presenting us as a, as a band, but I think it doesn't um, lessen any of the theatricality or any of the, uh, any, it doesn't lessen the, uh, it being a perform, a show kind of the whole thing because people tend to think that our personalities and, and characters and the, and the personality with, within the songs is really, um, you know, heightened. And so I think whether we have, uh, you know, any sort of uh, formal presentation like projections or anything, or whether we present ourselves as just a band. I think that either way, it's 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 a, a presentation that's really uh, you know presenting a, a show. You know, and it comes across even I think even more so at times when it's having to rely on just our personalities and the personalities of the song. So so. Um, 
In answer to your question, I don't know what we're going to be doing. 